I am the program director and senior scientist for the Arthur R. Marshall Foundation for the Everglades. And what we do is deliver science-based education and public outreach programs that are central to restoring the Everglades ecosystem and its historic river grass. And I'll also be a little bit surprised by some of the animations because I have to from a couple of different things in order to fit today's talk. So one of the things like Mark mentioned is, is we uh, have Classroom Everglades. So we're educating children and adults. And to do that, we take the children out into the Everglades. We plant trees where we can. So we're always in the process of identifying new places either around the Everglades or even in local wetland type areas um, where we can plant pond apple trees, cypress trees and do some habitat restoration and revitalization. Because like a couple of people have said out there, doing that really um, increases the vitality of your system and it protects us as well as protects uh, the plant and the other animals. So we also do naturalist-led experiences and we typically do that through Meetup. So you can look us up on Meetup and we'll take people out on guided tours. We did Shark Valley in December. And um, I'm by trade a geologist, so I've been working in the Everglades for 16 years as a hydrogeologist. And um, I worked on the oil spill for about three years. I thought, I think little pieces of my soul died. <laughs> and so now I, I, I've gone into the nonprofit world and this is what I'm doing. It's brought me full circle back to the Everglades. So we take um, our scientific experience, our natural uh, kind of interest, and we do our, our uh, trips. We do advocating and we help teach people how they can do some grassroots organizing to help uh, protect the environment and the actions that they can take to move forward with their, with their own personal desires. And we do a lot of public outreach. So we've got a speaker's bureau and we can go out and come to organizations or sometimes we borrow people from other organizations and bring them to our crowd. And what we think we need to do. Or we need to do. So we feel like no child should be left inside. And that's kind of a fundamental tenet of what we're doing. And I come up with that. That's from a book called uh, Last Child in the Woods because um, it, it seems to be that we're coming to an interesting um, crux or a, 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 a a confluence of activity or lack of activity where children aren't getting outside as often as they were, particularly, you know, when I was growing up, I'm 45, so um, so we were outside all the time. My mom locked the door and said, don't come back until it's dark. And you don't have that anymore. The world's a little different, parents are a little bit different, um, and some of the natural areas are a little bit different. So they're um, calling it, um, they, they coined the term nature deficit disorder. And that's what they're um, uh, essentially saying, that children are ha have a nature deficit disorder. They're not getting outside enough, and it's affecting them. It's affecting the way they develop physically. It's affecting the way they develop mentally and emotionally. Um, so that's one of the things we're uh, trying to incorporate in, in as far as the reasons and the impetus behind what we do. Like I said, uh, my animations, some of them might surprise me. <laughs> So now we'll get into the history of the Everglades. Some of this I'm going to blow through because this is kind of the combination of about three different presentations that we do. So I had to pick and choose. I'm going to read some of it a little fast. But when, uh, when uh, kind of North American settlers that were not Native peoples began to came, come here, essentially they thought our swamps are the greatest single menace that remains to public health. As a people, we cannot feel that our full duty has been performed until we have made these swamplands centers of prosperity and comfort for ourselves and those who shall come after. We're the ones who have come after. <laughs> they are not unproductive. They can be made sources of great national wealth. And by saying sources of great national wealth, they certainly didn't mean sources of environmental wealth. They meant sources of locations where we could farm and we could mine and we could live. So those were our those those were the priorities then, and that's a chief hydrographer <laughs> for the U.S. Geological Survey. So sometimes I know it's not just the Army Corps of Engineers. <laughs> well, your predecessors. It was. <laughs> so the Florida Everglades is a very fascinating. I'll get my pointer so I can back up a little bit. You can see that way. See if this little sucker works. Oh, maybe I have to turn it on. I saw it. it just, oh, there. Oh, it just shows, oh, it doesn't show up on the flat screen. Huh, that's good to know. 
<laughs> so here in the Florida Everglades consists of, most people think that the Everglades is Everglades National Park. Or maybe everything south of Lake Okeechobee. It's not. The Everglades watershed, and the reason the South Florida Water Management District encompasses, I believe, 63 counties, is because the Everglades actually starts up around Orlando and the Kissimmee River floodplain. So it's the Kissimmee River, which is the K, Lake Okeechobee to the O, and Everglades, the KOE system. And then, um, and so that's essentially how the water always flowed, and we'll talk about that in a while. So the historic river of grass, like you can see, is from Orlando into the lake, down into the remnant historic freshwater Everglades, and then down into Florida Bay. So everything kind of came this way. And these were the types of vegetation that were there. We had cypress swamps, sawgrass plains, the ridge and slough system. So you've got, you know, a slough, which is a depression, and a ridge, which is a mound. And those were, you know, could be tree islands and grassy areas. You have the Ochopke Marl Marsh, Big Cypress, Shark River Slough. So we went down to the um, Shark Valley, where we did a tour for people who were interested in December. And that was super fun. Uh, Black and Royal Marsh, and so these are in the Atlantic Coastal Ridge. So this is why the Everglades doesn't flow out into Biscayne Bay, is because of this ancient remnant dune system from uh, the past uh, particular places that the sea level rises. Most people understand that the seas have ri risen and lowered in, in Florida and all over the world um, for millions and millions of years. But that, this is our remnant dune system. It really goes all the way up the entire eastern uh, seaboard. But that's why it doesn't flow this way, it flows this way. Or it did flow that way. So, right. <laughs> so, it's supposed to flow that way. We'll see what it does now in a little bit. So, a little bit real quick background. Essentially, the modern, um, what, what the Native Americans and some of the Spanish explorers encountered was an Everglades that formed between five and 6,000 years ago. Pre-European settlement, Duquesta, Jaga, and other Native Americans, which were long before the Seminole and Miccosukee, they're a, a very uh, more modern addition. And they did dig a little bit of canals for navigation and some ceremonial purposes. But most of them lived typically along the Atlantic coastal ridge that was along the seaboard there because they could fish for swamp things on one side, fish for ocean life on another side, and be high and dry all the time and not in, you know, a nice breezy condition. So if you were here, um, you know, 2,000 years ago when they were all here, pretty much the only place you probably want to be. So in 1850, the Swamplands Act authorized 20 million acres for drainage. So they really were selling it. I got some swamp for you in Florida. So the deep muck soil in the Everglades. Um, and they were selling it, Everglades land sales, and they were selling it as incredible farmland, which it was. It was absolutely some of the richest soil you could possibly encounter on the planet Earth. 1881, Hamilton Distin cut an outlet for Lake Okeechobee to the Gulf of Mexico through the Caloosahatchee River. 1907, Napoleon Bonaparte Broward created the Everglades Drainage District, 7,150 square miles. 1917, four canals were dug to link Lake Okeechobee to the Atlantic Ocean. So they did not have that linkage before. The lake didn't drain out that way. 15 to 28, the Tamiami Trail was constructed. And it essentially was constructed and it was just a, a, a dam. It, it functioned as a complete and total barrier, for the most part, right across the Everglades. So 1926 and 28, those two major hurricanes, and I think there were a little bit more than that, some smaller ones, they claimed almost 3,000 people's lives. This is um, this was a port on the flood, flood damage, Florida Everglades Drainage District, 1941. They did a report, and that's the this is called the Weeping Cow. If you ever want to look it up and uh, and find that, it's a very famous um, report. 34 and 30. The Army Corps. I don't know why those two dates are so up, but whatever. The Corps became a major player and formed the Okeechobee Flood Control District. 1931, the St. Lucie Canal was completed, and the Caloosahatchee Lake was improved, and 75 kilometers of the Lake Okeechobee Dyke was built. So then that reduced the lake levels by about one meter. Congress established in 1974 Everglades National Park. Before that, they had a staff, or what was there was called Royal Palm Park. Wasn't that, that the name of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said you were said 1934, but you meant 1974. Right? 
Yes, I think so. I think somehow when I was transferring slides. But yes. Yeah. So that should be essentially Royal Palm Park is back in the 30s, and then Everglades National Park was up in the 70s. So those should be swapped. So thank you. <laughs> and then um, the in 1948 the. Authorized by Congress was the Central and Southern Florida Project as a multi-purpose project to provide flood control, water supply for municipal industrial agricultural uses, prevention of saltwater intrusion, so they were aware of that fact as far back as the 40s, and water supply for Everglades National Park, and protection of fish and wildlife resources. So th th there was a, 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 an awakening of sorts among the environmental community as to what had been engineered. They did it. The Corps is not always to be vilified. They were sent out to do a job. And they did a job. They did a magnificent job draining the Everglades. They did exactly what they were supposed to do. It's a feat of engineering that, you know, probably up to that point was as good as it could possibly get. They did their job. So they didn't go in trying to destroy an ecosystem. They simply didn't understand what we understand now as the value of that ecosystem. So around at some, starting in the 30s and 40, the late 30s and into the 40s, when you know Aldo Leopold um, was was writing Saint County Almanac and uh, purporting some of the things with the um, uh, the national wildlands that were developing out west, rather than just protecting things for hunting and human use, they wanted to start protecting them for their value in their own way, for their own intrinsic value. So, and here come the people. So, 52 to 54, the eastern perimeter of the levee was constructed parallel to the coastal ridge. That was that Atlantic coastal ridge I showed. 54 to 59, the water conservation areas, I'm going to show some features in a little while, were constructed. Very large pumps were installed. Agricultural area on the south of Lake Okeechobee was expanded from 50,000 acres to 700,000 acres of agriculture. Florida is a huge agricultural state. So we're walking a real thin line um, between the value of our agriculture in the national economy and in our state economy versus um, some of the detrimental effects that uh, can occur from, from relying so heavily on sometimes poor management practices versus better management practices. In 62, the L67 was constructed for conservation area three to control seepage into urban areas. Because now what was happening is, hey, I live here on the other side of these dunes, but now, oh, swamp water is coming and it's going to flood me. So they wanted to get that in bud, so they started building structures, and, uh, and that's how it was. So that is, this is Lake Okeechobee. So what we tell the kids, sometimes I'll break out some things that we tell like the third graders. So that looks like Winnie the Pooh. So here's Winnie the Pooh's head, here's his ear, here's his face, here's his jacket, his red jacket, because that's technically tends to be how it comes up on satellite image. This is the Everglades Agricultural Area. Those Winnie the Pooh, right? <laughs> but it's like, and it really hammers it into the kids' minds. They just immediately are able to recognize it everywhere they look from that point on. Even without this drawn in there, they're like, oh, it's Winnie the Pooh, and I was right there. So when we take them out to the Arthur R. Marshall Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge, that's this right here, and that's a water conservation area. That's WCA1. And um, on, this is Southern Boulevard right here. This is um, Stormwater Treatment Area 1 East, Stormwater Treatment Area 1 West. Those are along Southern Boulevard. If you drive down towards Lion Country Safari and you see all those grasslands to the south, those are big constructed wetlands. They're called stormwater treatment areas and they're filter marshes. So they're doing what the Everglades used to do because there has to be a buffer between all of these farms and then some of these areas that we need to hold water and then discharge it into the Everglades so the Everglades can be replenished because you simply can't well, let's open up the floodgates and just let the water go because it's got too much in it. And Where do they want to go? Um, Drew will know. <laughs> they want to do that. They'll be over here and then I'll be over here. Yeah. In Henry County. Yeah, in Henry. So, and yeah, so there's a lot of talk about that. So, essentially, so anyway, so that's Winnie's arm and his outfit and his feet and everything. So, so that really helps us. We, we're always looking for ways to um, make, <laughs> make the children actually understand and then remember it and really kind of sink in. So that's what this stuff looks like when you're standing there in person. There's some sugar cane and, and roll crops. I mean, we don't just grow sugar there. I don't let my staff say, you know, it's just sugar, just sugar, just sugar, because it's not. We, I think, we're the second to third largest 
agricultural state in Florida, and that's all kinds of crops. We grow corn, we grow tomatoes, we grow winter vegetables. We have a four season growing cycle here, and people don't realize that. Where you know, Illinois, I grew up in Illinois and Wisconsin, we've got a a micro season compared to us, you know, and if it's too wet in May, you can't get corn in the ground, and you'd ever, all of a sudden you drive around, there's just soybeans there. So, so we're very fortunate. So, uh, we, we've got a lot of um, flexibility at times with our and, and a lot of functionality. And it's, it's. I'm not completely against farming, but what we tell the staff is essentially there needs to be a balance. Genetically modified seeds, do they grow? Um. I'm sure they do because there isn't a there isn't a rule against it. So whatever an individual. We've farm. been told that they don't, but um, I don't trust on the corn. But we are told that they don't have GMO out there. There's no. We haven't found any evidence, but that's what the farm bureau is telling us. Yeah. Not and there's no rule against it. So so right now we don't have. There is no control over that necessarily. This is um, obviously the lower East Coast urbanized area, so all the white on the map. These great, these satellite maps are great for the kids because you know it's uh, that's that's what's the white? We ask, you know, where's the farms and where are you standing? And they have no idea. So this is all development, and it's hard for them to understand it. This is um, uh, the peat glades, so sort of the swampy grasslands, and this is a marsh transverse glades. Um, so these are the, kind of how the different two areas look. Um, So currently the CSF, um, 18,000 square miles, more than 1,000 miles of levee, 720 miles of canals, and over 200 water control structures. And you can only um, rail against the machine, uh, or rage against the machine too, not too often because we all do live here. So we wouldn't be living here without all of this uh, infrastructure. So essentially, like I said with the farming, we're kind of trying to strike a balance with restoration. So here's the historic flow. Like I said, it went and it went out, and a little bit went this way. Um, but that's the coastal ridge, so it blocked the vast majority of that, and it all went into Florida Bay. It was all fresh water. Kissimmee River looked like this. It was a great, broad, meandering floodplain, just like you see the Mississippi River, and it overflows. And then every, if, if anybody floods, the rest of the country says, "Oh my God, why don't they move out of the floodplain?" Hey, we did it too. <laughs> so we put people in the floodplain. We channelized that river. We took it from looking like that to a straight line from Orlando to the lake. I'll talk about that in a minute. Now the flow, after they cut those channels, these red are all channels. So it's direct flow out of the lake. There's some that goes to St. Lucie, a lot more that goes to Coosahatchee, and then through all these channels, and then look at all these canals now that go down through where we live. So that's why we've got you know the C-51 up the street. That's why we've got all these canals. People, I want a house on a canal. So, so it's not, people are still doing it and they're still sort of, there's a desire there. It's like, and they don't get to live on a river. So like, oh, they're gonna make the most of living on a canal. Interesting. Um, consequences for us now, we've lost um, wetland areas, obviously. Modifications of the flow pattern, um, which was pulsed. And, it and so now it's not a pulsed flow pattern for the most period. And that reduced the hydro period, which means the natural times of year that the water would either sit or move has been altered artificially. Um, and you can sometimes see that in your yard. And, and, and once you kind of get a feel for natural areas, you understand that you know, water is supposed to be there sometimes and not supposed to be there other times. And we just don't have that anymore. We messed it all up. Unnatural pooling and over drainage. Um, so things uh, that even would have sort of stayed stagnant and stationary, it's like, we've dropped them all down. Um, accelerated reversal of muck building um, to rapid oxidation. <coughs> oxidation is the loss of peat. So what underlays all those marshes is peat. What that muck soil is in the Everglades Agricultural Area is the peat that built up over thousands and thousands and thousands of years of Everglades just sitting there, you know, not messed with. So it would just plants would decompose, and they'd build some peat. Plants would decompose, and they'd build some peat. And nothing was cutting them down and exposing that peat to air. Once we cut it down, drained it, exposed it to air, that oxidizes the peat, which then makes it erode, essentially. Um, so it, it, it just decomposes, because peat's, peat's an organic matter um, that doesn't function quite the same way as normal soil. Um, it's hard for me sometimes to get into it, because I start losing it. It's getting a sort of science degree too. <laughs> so it's like, sometimes I get it in the nuts and bolts of it, and I just have to say it real simple. So and so, but that's because we unnaturally reduce the flow of fresh water to Florida Bay. Um, 
So the ecological consequences, there's been a 90-95% reduction in wading bird populations. There's 63 of the threatened and endangered species are in the Everglades. 1.7 billion of gallons of water a day are sent to tide, which means they're just dumped. The they're just flushed into the ocean. So, and it's a weird way that we all say it, kind of in the di in the business, but it's just dumped out to the ocean, and it's not used, it's not saved. There's nowhere to put it, or we would flood. Um, a million acres are under health advisories for mercury contamination. So there's a lot that you can't fish, and most of the state of Florida, there are a lot of um, unfishable waters, or there's a there's an eating limit. There may not be a catch limit on some, but there's an eating limit. Um, very much like the Great Lakes. You know, Pregnant women can't eat fish out of the Great Lakes. That's very, very much the same here. A um, million and a half acres infested with invasive exotic plants. So those are like Goldium, which is an old world climbing fern, and Melaleuca. A lot of the things that we brought in to drain the swamp. You know, they brought in Australian pine and Melaleuca, and they thought, hey, it's going to suck up all the water and dry us all out. And they're a wonderful species in Australia. They're absolutely, utterly invasive and torturous here to our ecosystem. And then we have declining populations of commercially and recreational uh, important species of fish, and particularly in the St. Lucie and Caloosahatchee estuaries and the bays. Because what we've done by altering the freshwater entering those bays, in the Florida Bay, you should have freshwater entering the bays, and it's not properly. So that estuary where it's being poisoned by a lack of freshwater. The two on the sides on Lake Okeechobee are t typically being poisoned by an excess of fresh water. So what the bigger problem with dumping water out of Lake Okeechobee is not always that it comes out, because if it was just a pulse, boom, yeah, you get a storm event, you get a, a big release of a bunch of water, and then it flushes out of the system and everything's okay. It's the constant release of too much fresh water that those estuaries are not capable of handling because they have to have the right fresh salt balance for the seagrasses to survive and the oyster beds to survive. And then their nurseries, they are, it's like the Amazon jungle underwater. Estuaries are the nurseries of the entire ocean. So when you mess with that, you mess with everything up the food chain. Um, and then everything that we want to fish and go look at when we go diving, etc. Defoliation of the seagrasses, fish kills, and deformed fish in the St. Lucie estuary is a problem. And then we have repetitive water sources when we have drought because we don't have um, uh, the aquifer is not properly recharging. Um, and then if we suck it too far down, we've got salt water intrusion. There was a restudy done, quote unquote, the restudy in 1992. Those were the partners who did it, and they were essentially investigating hey man, what have we done? What can we do? The conclusion was we got to get the water right quantity, quality, timing, and distribution. So the Water Resources Development Act is in Congress, that's a congressional act of Congress. Congress approved the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, or SERP, an estimated cost uh, back in the day of $7.8 billion. And by 2005, 10.9 billion. And by today, I just leave that blank. <laughs> um, and essentially, uh, it has 68 components. And this is sh this shifts around. Like every time you make a slide, a year later, it shifts around, and the numbers are a little bit different. But essentially, 68 components um, to that plan, 34-year implementation period. And and that seems like a lot, and it gets a lot of us frustrated. I've been working in the Everglades for 16 years as a professional scientist. It is so frustrating for me to realize that I started in 1998, WERDA and SERP was passed in 2000, and to me, I feel like in 15 years, nothing has happened. Things have, things have happened, yeah. exactly. Things have happened, but I feel like they haven't. But at the same time, it took us 100 years of dredging and building and sucking and moving water very effectively to get where we are now. So taking 30 to 40 years to fit, fit a nat fix a natural system isn't horrible, it's just very frustrating. And you tend to, if we don't inspire people to continue to fight and push for it, we'll start to lose the impetus. And then you know things will slow down, and then it'll be 20 years from now, not enough happened, and then everybody's waving their hands like you know the, the sky is falling. Um, you know, because we haven't done enough interest right now to continue or enough hard work right now to continue the motivation and the interest. So there's some surface water stores. ASR wells are aquifer storage and recovery, where they take clean water, 
treated water, inject it into the ground, and then leave it there for a time that we need to take it back out during an emergency water shortage, treat it again, and use it. There's a lot of controversy around that. Constructed wetlands, those were the stormwater treatment area, not fully sure we did. Um, and it removes 240 miles of barriers to flow, which, um, which is essentially taking out some of the canals and building bridges and restructuring what's in the way of the water moving. So that's what it looks like for us to move our water. So you'll go along Southern Boulevard and you'll see something along the lines of this. Um, uh, the first project I ever worked at was Pump Station 332B, or S332B, and C, and A, and those were for the Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow Project. That was, I think, 1998, and, and I was sampling down there for that. And I'd never seen anything, like, you walk, you think you're in a swamp in the middle of the Everglades, and then you run across a pump station, and you're like, oh my god, <laughs> this is incredible. And, and they're fascinating, and just the feats of engineering of what it takes to not flood our homes. That's what it takes for us to live here, is this. So, the effects of restoration, though, can be profound. Kissimmee River, like I said in that map, it used to be all swervy and, and wavy, just the way a beautiful river should be. And they came through and they're like, you know what? We're just going to make this river nice and efficient, get all that water straight down the Lake Okeechobee. And they did. They just redug the river. And they just made a straight highway of water straight into the lake. And so what are the effects of that? And even still, so, so what used to happen in the system is the water would flow very, very excruciatingly slowly from the Kissimmee River Valley down into Lake Okeechobee, sit there for a while, eventually there'd be an event where it would overflow the bottom of the lake because it wasn't a dike there, it was just a slightly raised area, and then it would come into the Everglades and go wherever it was bound to go. Um, this situation we're in now, the lake fills up, during a rain event in Orlando, the lake fills up seven times faster than the core can dump it out. So one of the reasons they have to do those releases, their preemptive releases into the Caloosahatchee and the St. Lucie, because they have, they're like, oh my god, on Wednesday it's going to rain in Orlando, or in May it's going to start raining in the rainy season. So they have to start lowering the lake level, because the situation of the dike right now is tenuous. They can't let the water get above 16 feet right now is the floor schedule, so they don't let it get above 16 feet because the chance of a catastrophic failure of the dike is too high, and the loss of life and property would be utterly catastrophic. I don't think that even you'd have a localized Hurricane Katrina. And right now, it's an earthen dam. If they didn't build a big, giant, you know, Hoover dike or Hoover dam around it, it's an earthen dam. So they piled up a bunch of earth, and that's how they built it in, in the 30s when they put it in, or the 20s and 30s. So it's natural for water to seep through an earthen dam a little bit under the pressure from the inside. What's happening now is water is seeping through the dam, and it's bringing material with it. So it's bringing the dam with it because it's flowing at too great a rate at Week, two week of spots. So they're reconstructing the dam, which most or the dike, which most of you know, um, and that is again another 20 year effort, if not longer, unless somehow they've uh, allowed it now to, to flood periodically. They use a proper hydro period to flood that floodplain. It's all looks like that. Wow. It's incredible. Yeah, they did. It is one of the really, really neat restoration projects, and I think this year, are they on track for this year being the completion of the Kissimmee River Restoration Project? And it's taken, God, at least a decade. Um, and it's just, it's beautiful. And the wildlife, you can go down that river, and it's just like nothing you've ever seen before. It's, it's, it's like being in another country. Um, so you ever place the overall projects? <laughs> So, and that doesn't even, com that doesn't even com encompass all the individual projects. These are the major sort of categories of projects and what they have to do. This is um, something new. This is the next wave of Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, which you'll see it in the newspaper. Instead of saying CERP, C-E-R-P now, or C-E-R-P, they're going to start, most of the time they publish it as CEPP, C-E-P-P. -P. So they're trying to take this whole chunk of things in the middle 
and, um, and accelerate and expand what they're doing. But a lot of work had to be done on the outside to get things ready. Everything has to be done in stages and um, properly mapped out. Challenges, what are we restoring it to? We can't restore it to the historic Everglades because they're half gone and a meter or more of peat has been oxidized. And what does getting the water right actually mean? You can say a lot of things and give it all sorts of fancy titles, but what does it mean scientifically? How do we keep the plan responsive to changing knowledge and sustain funding for the project over a 30, 40 year period? So what we mean by cha uh, uh, changing knowledge, what we knew in the 30s is not what we know in the 50s, which is not what we knew in the 70s, which is not what we knew in 2000, and it's definitely not what we know now, especially in response to climate change and sea level rise, particularly in this system. So it can certainly be done faster and greener. And that, that's what we all sit around talking about all the time. Like, oh, you go to a science meeting and talk about this stuff some more. And but we have to, and you have to get the. You have to. There are so many stakeholders involved between agencies and people and users, and then just the scientific minds that you have to bring in from engineers to ecologists to biologists, geologists, and everything. It's just it's an incredible collective effort. So we've got Kissimmee River restoration, so that's creating more natural storage in the system and stormwater treatment areas. So those, like I said, um, up above the refuge, right here, that's the little orange one, storm uh, STA 1 west and 1 east, and then this is the Luxahatchee refuge. And here's another one. So all these little orange ones are treating farm water and runoff before they get into the storage areas that then eventually, if it's clean enough, they can release it in Everglades National Park after they raise up the Rutanium Trail. Um, and decompartmentalization, that is removing some of those barriers. Trail right here. That's it. Oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. See, is that, that happening now? Are that is happening now. now. Yeah, they are, it is happening now. They're raising the trail. They're decompartmentalizing Water Conservation Area 3A, and um, and they're kind of everyone's rethinking a little bit how how they're how we're moving forward. Why are they raising the trail? To to <coughs> allow the water to flow beneath it, because essentially right now it's its own to to restore barrier. the sheet flow. It's its own barrier. Right. Yeah. So. In terms of saltwater intrusion coming in here, mm -hmm. it would sort of make sense to have more water like come out of water. Talk about that. What agencies? I'll talk about that. Um, so are the plants sufficiently robust? Are they resilient to climate change? I stole this slide from um, Joel Van Arnhem at the Water Management District. <laughs> He's kind enough to uh, share his stuff with us sometimes. Um, so there's a lot of landscape changes under sea level rise and urbanization. So we've got current urban areas, strategic ecological areas. So these are ecological areas that we feel are important. Um, existing Department of Interior Conservation Areas. And then the green, when it shows up, will be future protected areas. So here's the DOI. Now seas rise. And the areas you protected today may not be the areas you have to protect tomorrow. Does that make sense? So as the seas rise, some of what we're doing today is going to shift. So can we let people move in here? Can we let people move in here? Can we let encroachment be part of that? That's something that we have to very seriously consider in the future plans. Um, so gone, gone, gone. Those protected areas. The biggest thing is going to be Turkey Point nuclear power plant, which is going to be in the water. Right. And that's going to be a real issue. Right. It's going to be it's tremendous. So um, the ecosystem services with loss of flood protection. Ecosystem service is the, the value, the added benefit that just being a natural system provides to us. So one of those, and that's very hard to quantify for people because for us, we're like, well, how do you put a price on priceless? And for other people, they're like, eh, who cares? What does it do for us? You have to very carefully explain what does it do for us? What are its ecosystem services? Uh, this natural area, one of its ecosystem services is flood protection. If we can't simply take every single bit of water and get rid of it, we just can't because we need to, we need to refill the aquifer. What most people don't understand is where we get our water, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So we would lose flood protection by not doing the Everglades. So sea level rise and Everglades restoration, um, at this point most of us believe <laughs> that they go hand in hand. 
<laughs> so now it, we're starting to rethink the fact that they are our, our twin goals um, to restore the Everglades and uh, protect ourselves and adapt to sea level rise. So the main goals of SERP was to restore natural flow of water as, as natural as we could get to, improve the quality of the water, and increase the area of the system that manages the water. So take it out of these little canals and small areas and make it much more of a vast sheet flow to the greatest extent possible. So natural systems, they accommodate migration from climate and ecosystem shifts, provide suitable areas for migration inland and upland because animals move, people have to move, you've got to protect things in order for that to happen in the future. We're not, we're not looking 50 years into the future anymore, we're not Congress looking only six years into the future, we have to look 100, 500, and 1,000 years into the future the way they do in Denmark. They, they make a 1,000 year plan and we're not used to thinking that way in the United States because we've only been here for a few hundred years as ourselves. In Europe, they're a little bit more used to that, particularly after they cut down all their fours, and they're like, oh, crap, now we don't have any trees. And you know, they're like, oh, the face now there's no trees, and we're not getting any smaller, and Europe's not getting any bigger. So, so you know, they, they got to that point 200 years ago and, and started to rethink some of the ways that, that they planned forward. Some of them, not, not everyone. So, and then, and then we need to maintain fresh water levels and flows for exactly the reason. So, we're going from this. This is our system now, all right? It's hodgepodge, it's blurry, it's all mixed up and, and broken into pieces and crap. And we want to turn into this. This is our water. This is the situation with our water. It, it's everything to us. Tara, what is the Greenway project that they're proposing now for south of us? I don't know, what's it, Hendry County? They want to pave across east to west, make a trail on the ground. You heard of that? I think it's called Greenway. Uh, it's in Tamiami. They want to put a path along the Tamiami Trail. East and Some west. things I defer to Drew because he's Sierra Club, so there's a lot that right. he's more hands-on yeah. than I have to be. There's a, there was a group that wanted to put a bike path along there, but there's a lot of concern that that will become permanent and it might impact the ability to raise Tamiami Trail, which is the ultimate goal is to raised him even trail so that the water right. can flow. So in. why are they even proposing this? Well, because, because different people want different things. Because they can, things. Things. They can propose it, it doesn't mean it'll get through. So that's our job then, um, as citizens, if, if, if with our concern is to voice that as many places as possible, because people don't always know. People in charge of making some of those decisions, unless we all let them know what the impacts and realities are. They just don't know it. You think that they're informed, they're not out there getting themselves informed. Right. We're Save our ones. creeks, which I belong yeah. to a board member. We've suddenly discovered that that's in the works. So now we're trying yeah. to mobilize and get some. So the alternative is to narrow the motor vehicle lanes on the Miami Trail, which is actually right. We want to raise. Uh, we want to raise the Miami Trail. Right. Right. To keep the same same width. Right. Right of way width. Right. But narrow the motor vehicle lanes, right. which can happen. and that can give like space for service. Yeah. Um, so, so the, like I said earlier, the quality, the quantity, the timing, and the distribution of the water are the four things that matter. Yeah. So uh, by quality, you know what that means. Does it have too many pollutants to be released into the Everglades? The quantity, how much water is there, because it's a Goldilocks system. When you think about the Everglades, it can't be too high, it can't be too low. It's a very Goldilocks uh, ecosystem. The timing of the water is also related to the quantity. So in the summer and winter, it might be high or low, but then we go through a drought, and normally there'd be some rebound, but we've artificially managed the system so much that we're not able to store water, to release it during a drought, or store it just to not release it to tide. So there are a lot of different reasons why we have to uh, take a look at the timing. And then the distribution, where's it going? You know, where's it going and who's going to be able to use it? Um, the impacts and a sea level rise in South Florida, we start to think of that because it's a, it has a direct impact on the entire system. Mm -hmm. Climate, sea level rise, intensifying storms with changes in rainfall pattern. It might rain more here, it might rain less here. It, might, it will get hotter here, so the evaporation will increase. But they're still not quite sure <laughs> if it'll rain more, if it'll rain less. If it'll rain less, but then the storms will be stronger. All of those patterns, or changes in rainfall patterns, will change the way we manage the system. Right now, we can't handle it. Salt water intrusion, contamination of the underground water supply and surface water. Surface water, that means salt water intrusion coming up and turning what is sort of a mixed freshwater estuary into the largest 
saltwater estuary in the world, if seas were to rise without an accompanying southerly flow of fresh water. Um, the roadways and railways are all being, uh, they'll be at risk of being undermined by water infiltrating from below, so they cause a base saturation. They saturate the base of the roadway, which is more or less earthen, so you pile up dirt, and you put concrete on top of it, and you have a road. But if the water table, if those roads are built here, and the water table's down there, and now sea level rise comes in from underneath the freshwater table, raises up that freshwater table, so it's sitting on top of the salt water because it floats on top of the salt water, then that makes your water table higher. So a road that's built to have a water table down there suddenly has a constant water table up here that under that undermines the effectiveness and the ability of that um, infrastructure to even exist, let alone resist um, anything that might come out of it, be it a, a storm event or, you know, other places in the world have to do with earthquakes. And then the flood control system of primary canals and secondary drainage systems are inadequate. I spell that well. Are inadequate for the increases. So we don't have a system of primary and secondary canals that can get rid of enough water or hold enough water or spread them all around. It's just not. It, 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 it works for what we do now. It doesn't work for some of these future modeled scenarios of more water. Flood control system, oh, I put that on the other slide. See what happens when I cut and paste? Sewers are in disrepair, disrepair already, which most people know, and the coastal structures and the pump stations will lose capacity because they can only handle as much as they can handle now. Other utilities, phone lines, electrical, um, buried electrical lines, all that stuff will be affected, and so can property access. If you suddenly, you know, two days out of the month can't get in or out of your property because there's a flooding event, and even, you know, particularly in South Beach when it just floods during high tide, and suddenly, really, once a day I can't go home? What are you going to do? That's a lost property access. Um, and the reason for that is because we live on limestone. We live on very, 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 very hard Swiss cheese. And if you put a block of Swiss cheese in your sink full of water, there's going to be water everywhere. And if you try to use that block of Swiss cheese to block water from going one place to the other, it wouldn't work. It would go right through the Swiss cheese and go wherever you're trying to keep it out of. That's the problem with when people say, why can't we just build um, levees around Florida? Why can't we build a dike? Why can't we do what they did in the Netherlands? But because they have a completely different kind of bedrock. And we have porous limestone, the water you can build whatever the heck you want, it's going to go right underneath it and come right back up anyway. And because of the density difference between fresh water and salt water, um, it'll interact in a, in a way that other water doesn't. More fresh water flow will help build up the peak. So the Everglades is the sponge. It catches the water that either falls on it or flows over it. It holds it like a sponge. It cleans it if it's allowed to sit there because then it leaks down into the aquifer, which is what aquifer recharge is. It leaks down through the soil, down through the stone, and it recharges the aquifer, which is our drinking water. Then we reach in with a well, and we poke a hole in there, just like a straw. But you poke a straw into a Twinkie, and you suck out the filling. That's what we're doing. We're poking a straw into the Twinkie. The filling in the Twinkie is the water, and we're sucking it out. And that's what we use. We drink, we farm, we wash our cars, we take a bath, we manufacture things, and we use it to make energy. People don't realize how much water we use to manufacture and, and, and energy. And then, you know, obviously all the sprinklers that we have on all the time. So, more freshwater flow is a countermeasure to saltwater intrusion. So you are exactly right by saying that. Improve, and then I'll go into that in two seconds. So improving water quality and healthy ecosystems are just already more resilient to change. So the healthier you can make the entire system, the more resilient to change it is. We're facing change here. So our only options are going to be to adapt. And what we need to do is adapt in the most effective, whole way that we can. And um, a, a really effective and full force Everglades conservation and protection and restoration is the best way for us to do it in South Florida. And by increasing the area, um, we're increasing the area of groundwater recharge, which we need all those people and all of us need this water. <laughs> So the reason we need it, so that's more ecosystem services value. It gives us our drinking water. We have drinking water quality supply for two out of three residents in South Florida, 
get their water from the aquifer re being recharged by the Everglades. The consumptive use, energy manufacturing, like I said, human use for recreation, fishing, hunting, camping, boating, hiking, habitat protection of non-commercial species and habitat com protection of commercial species, particularly the, the nursery situation for hunting and fishing. That's what those wetlands. So what it does when you send, so if you've got your fresh water and now, and this is your Twinkie filling, and here's your Twinkie, and you stuck straw in there, and now you're taking out the water, and you need to drink it, um, you eventually get to a point where this, this salt water, if it's rising and rising, it comes up in here, and it just pushes that away, away and it intrudes in the salt water, and it contaminates your well. If you put more fresh water, so the force of the fresh water coming into the system is greater than the force of the salt water rising and pushing in to the system from this direction, then you'll be able to keep your source fresh. And the only way to do that is send the right amount of water south into the system. So this is essentially a couple more. <laughs> uh, restoring the Everglades can be a countermeasure to sea level rise and problems by preventing the saltwater intrusion. It encourages the peak formation, which helps to clean the water when it is allowed to sit. It improves the resilience of the overall habitat. There's an overall large increase in the ecosystem services values to South Florida. Climate Central published in the New York Times, as sea levels rise, Everglades becomes more vital to South Florida's survival. And then here are the things that you can start doing to take action. If you want to do something, support the further land acquisition in the Everglades agricultural area and send the water south. Every time you see it, you get on board with that. Um, support and fully fund the National Park Service's the five and a half Tammy Trail Bridging Project, um, which means you know when they ask people for support and they ask people for tax dollars or whatever it is that they're going to go through, really start learning about what that means to you. And these two are in conjunction with one, one another. Support the Central Everglades Planning Project. That's what we talked about the newest component of CERP. Um, if you want to do anything, if you want any more information, just go to our website and come find me. Um, these are players you need to talk to still. For some reason, there's a, a few people in the Senate that just won't leave. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and some people stand in the way and some people don't. Bill Nelson's very engaged. Um, you know, if you're a Wellington uh, District 86 representative or a uh, resident, uh, Mark Packard's very engaged. And, uh, and Palm Beach County has a really, really great uh, state contingent. So all of our uh, representatives in Tallahassee are just terrific. And, and a number of the ones in Washington are, are really good too. Um, and we're lucky that way. And this is the way we think. If you're thinking a year ahead, so a seed. If you're thinking 10 years ahead, plant a tree. And if you're thinking 100 years ahead, educate people. And it's the only way to really move things forward. Oh, really long. I'm sorry. Thank you. And if anyone needs my card, I'll leave some up here. So. Cool. Anyone have any questions? No, go ahead, Richard. I'm sorry. Well, it's certainly I just want to thank everyone for coming to uh, hear Tara speak. Yeah, thank you. Thank Wes Blackman for videotaping this. Wes is chair of the Historic Preservation oh, Board. Cool. Uh, the and this will be on YouTube, my YouTube channel, yeah. so oh, you okay. can look for Wes Blackman. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did, I you did look great. It, I did preface it when I had food poisoning yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I did very well. It didn't pass out during the presentation. That's good. That's really good. Your color is good. <laughs> So let me ask you one question. Sure. That is, um, you were talking about wells mm -hmm. and how you can keep the water fresh by pushing fresh water out toward the sea. Mm -hmm. um, what about like, That's you know, it's, um, it's my contention that we have uh, the railroad corridor here, um, the FEC railroad corridor running right through town. Right. What about raising that up? We talked about how like the salt water sea level rise can undermine the soils underneath that. Is that? That's yes. That's the kind of thing that's going to have to be addressed. And is is that investment to raise the rail? <laughs> and would that be, uh, I don't know. Um, what yeah. that the basically the next phase of sea level rise planning. 
consists of um, the engineers that are finally becoming a little more well versed in it because you know there was a lot of there was a lot of reticence. Um, to get involved in it because it wasn't being supported by some agencies. Over the last 10 years, the agencies have all get, gotten involved. Even the Water Management District doesn't talk all the time about sea level rise the way they could potentially, considering especially the kinds of mines that are there. Um, so, the engineers and the city planners and the departments of transportation around the country are only now starting to really consider what the future will look like and what kind of infrastructure changes are going to have to be made. But yeah, a lot of the coastal cities, if, uh, if the railroads aren't built right now to withstand the impact of rising seas, whether it's the, the groundwater coming up on the rising seas or if it's close enough, the actual uh, surge, storm surges. So they're not, most things, even a few more miles inland, aren't built to, to resist that kind of storm surge. I mean, look what happened in So which, which comes first, the storm surge, or what's the scientific opinion, you know, consensus? The storm um, surge, does that come first, or is the, it the intrusion the, underneath? Both, but what's really going to make movement happen, I think, is the first time under a sea level rise scenario, so given the next 20 years, as the water starts to measurably come up, and people stop denying that it's coming up, it's like, oh, well, that's not very much, that's not very much. Fine, it's not very much until you see a high tide storm surge. So essentially, I think it's going to be a catastrophic event on some that really changed some people's minds. Most of us are already in that camp. Most of the city planners and engineers get it. They just haven't been able to move forward. And the money, the money involved in either retrofitting infrastructure or completely redoing infrastructure is astonishing. And then the laws regarding what happens if your infrastructure is destroyed. At what point do you give up and not rebuild? You know, at what point do you actually make the decision to migrate? And the insurance industry is going to drive that. The insurance industry is on top of it and they're just going to say, eh, sorry, we're not helping you rebuild. rebuild. We warned you. We warned you 10 years ago. You've been lucky for 10 years. We're not, gonna, we're not helping you rebuild there. I think I, there's going to be a big issue, too, with the filling in, continuous filling in of additional wetlands, because that's where a lot of the flood protection and storm surge can be absorbed. The same is true with mangroves. Yep. Mangrove trees have, have a tremendous resiliency, native dune systems. But the more we develop, the more we remove those types of uh, natural native infrastructure. Right. And our normal buffers. It would be good. And there, there may be some people in the insurance companies already who know this stuff. Oh, there are. If the insurance company is driving the, the real change, I, I feel. Um, they are the ones driving it because they are saying, hey, everybody, look at this. We get it. And we're not putting our money out there and risking it on this. And so they've already made there's a primary insurance company, the reinsurance companies, because there are those, it's a whole different sort of industry. And they said they're they're not gonna do it. We, we had a really interesting meeting. There's a group called the Lake Worth Habitat uh, planning committee and it's part of the Lake Worth Lagoon Committee. And we have talked about how the county offers sustainable plantings. Well, that will actually help people put it in, but people are resisting that. So I suggested, well, if people got a uh, reduction in their property insurance, that would be an incentive to do that. Because a lot of people are still fighting, you know, native systems that don't want to see mangroves and they think it blocks their view. Yeah. <laughs> sure. That's exactly right. There's a lot of it, uh, it blocks, education. It blocks their view of the most polluted uh -huh. section of the world. Yes. But they don't realize that because they don't even know anything. Like when we try to explain, we'll go into classrooms, we'll try to explain rivers to kids. Like, oh, well, it's like a river or a grass. Like, river? Like, they just, because I, I don't, I didn't realize until recently that there are a lot of kids who honestly have just never even seen a river. I didn't think that was possible, but it is. They've never seen a river. They don't even really understand that the canal is kind of a river, and half of them haven't even seen the canals. And we go into a lot of Title I schools, and they just don't know. Their parents don't know. The people who aren't in Title I school, the people who are in charter school, their parents aren't educated and they don't know. So it's just a matter of educating people sort of with the right terminology and not turning them off to whatever your message is. Because, you know, you have to do this, you need to do that, and 
know, you really suck if you don't get it done, and look at you helping to destroy the world. But if you really kind of wake them up to the beauty of what they can be participating in, that it, it tends to be a little more effective. And man, people just don't know. Tara, I, I moved here in 2012, and I have not seen the river. Is there a river here? Lox, uh, yeah, go to the Loxahatchee River. Go to okay. River Bend Does that come to the coast? Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, you can kayak. Yes. You, you can, can actually kayak, kayak down the Loxahatchee River. Go to Jupiter. Where, where is it? Oh, it drops out in Jupiter. No, it starts. It, well, <clears throat> go to River Bend Park in Jupiter, put your boat in, and then you go north, and okay. you go to the intercoastal, <laughs> and you can go out to the ocean or up into the intercoastal. Or other kind of sections of the so river. So the intercoastal is to see. They, yeah, they go. Um, if, That's uh, where the uh, the, the Jupiter the, Inlet's like right here. So the intercoastal is here, and the Loxahatchee River is here, and they meet and go out the intercoastal. Okay, so where the um, at the, at the Jupiter the, Inlet, the lighthouse. The lighthouse is. Yep. It kind of flows from grassy waters, but the, yep. a lot of it's been broken and right. off. Originally, the uh, Loxahatchee River actually flowed from. Uh, out where you have uh, the Mecca farms, that, and they want to put all these developments in. You hear now that was always the, that was the headwaters of the Loxahatchee River. The river still exists, but it doesn't go as far inland as. It and it was to. Florida's first wild and scenic river for a long, long time. It was the only wild and scenic uh, designated river in Florida. Now there's another one. I get it's one of the opinion, right? Um, but it's, it's just gorgeous. When you see Clyde Butcher in a river that's only the width of this room. And yeah. with all the, you know, his big black and white and, and stuff, he, a lot of those are at, on the Loxahatchee River out of It's really quite pretty. No, it's it funny. It's, I had just a, a bicycle, only bicycle up there once, so. Yeah. Uh, but I do remember the lighthouse. I just didn't know. Yeah, put your boat in at River Bend Park off Indian Town Road. Uh -huh. And, there are um, alligators in there. Well, you can rent kayaks there. Yeah. You can rent kayaks for the day. Yeah. yeah, there are gators in there, but they're they're fine. Big cypress trees. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, the mangroves are moving more inland now because of the change in salinity. Tara, I, I just want to reiterate, I thought this was a tremendous presentation. I'm going to be testing my, my girlfriend, Kelly, to see. Good luck. Just email me. I'll send you the answers. <laughs>